This podcast is brought to you by The Shift. It's story time! Hello and welcome back to the Storytime Podcast. My name is Claire. I go by Clues Air on the internet and this is the podcast where guests come on to tell me their stories. And this week I have with me Ashling Dolan. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Would That's you like to me. introduce yourself and tell everyone where to find you on the internet? Yep. Uh, my name is Ashling Dolan. I'm one of the producers of the How the Yes Was One podcast. And you can find us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at How the Yes Was One. Just nice and simple across the board. Yeah. So you have a podcast that's out now. Episode eight is out now. It's about the repeal campaign, isn't it? And how um, I suppose maybe we should explain the repeal campaign quickly for any non-Irish people listening. Yeah, it basically, so in 1983, um, there was a referendum. <laughs> Quick explanation. So in 1983. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just so used to the spiel now at this stage. Like, oh my God, we've been doing this podcast for three years. I don't know where to start the story. Because that's kind of, actually, that's kind of why we did the podcast. Because a lot of the story starts in 2018, but it actually didn't start then. Like the campaign for repeal had been running since even before the Eighth Amendment was introduced. So the Eighth Amendment was introduced in 1983 and it was an amendment in the Irish Constitution that prohibited abortion basically in all circumstances, the most one of the most restrictive bans on abortion in the world. So it didn't matter if the baby was going to survive. It didn't actually end up mattering if the mother was going to survive. You still couldn't get an abortion. So um, there was a campaign really from about 2012 onwards demanding that that be removed from the constitution which became the repeal campaign repeal was the slogan everybody had repeal jumpers repeal badges it was repeal the eighth so we decided after the campaign in 2018 which we won it did get repealed just in case you're wondering spoiler alert um <laughs> we were talking about it and we realized that we actually kind of didn't know where the eighth amendment had kind of come from like because we have this idea like you like you know we always just think like the 80s in Ireland is like the 40s in other countries. You always just think it's like <laughs> backwards. That's like, you know, but actually like when we started talking to people, that's kind of not the story. What the story actually is, is there's people, regular people just living their lives, understanding the nuance and reasons why people might want to have an abortion or might want to have a child out of wedlock, which was also a big thing then. Um, and you just have this one group of like religious right nut jobs basically who control the conversation and they controlled it in the 80s and they gradually lost control over 35 years and then we won and we just have to make sure that we keep winning because yeah. they're still there <laughs> um yeah so I think I've made content before about repeal I've definitely put up pictures on Instagram of the repeal jumper so people that have been around for a while have definitely heard some of the stuff I think I had someone on story I did have someone actually on story time before telling the story about how she had to fly to the UK to get an abortion because that was what you had to do before the eighth got repealed yeah for a long long time like really from from the start people were doing that what, what's actually what we learned that was really interesting is that even before the eighth amendment was introduced like abortion was illegal before the eighth amendment was introduced in ireland so there was kind of this whole thing of like why even put it in the constitution like there's no you can't have it anyway but basically before the eighth amendment was introduced the well woman clinic and the irish family planning association actually had relationships with hospitals in the uk and they would have block book beds at the weekend. So they would have block book like 150 beds and be actually referring people to clinics. Wow. So people were still traveling to the UK in the late 70s and the early 80s. But they had that extra kind of bit of security that there was a relationship between them and the clinic that they then returned to for aftercare in Ireland. And they actually didn't think the pro-choice activists and the people who were running those clinics didn't think that the Eighth Amendment would change that. But what actually did happen was the religious right, once they got that foot in the door, and this organization, Spock, which is the worst name of all time. This That's a horrendous the, name. Horrendous. Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child, Spock. They came up with that themselves. Like that's just an indication of the type of character involved, right? They, they <laughs> basically started suing these clinics for providing that service. So all that stopped. And they actually, the pro-choice activists didn't think it would. They were like, oh, fucking shite. Like we're, we're, but we'll keep, but they couldn't. It all stopped. So it was actually much worse than they thought it was going to be at the time. Yeah, because it... Anyone thought it was going to be. It basically outlawed, like, even providing information, didn't it? Yeah, no information. If you... Yeah, you couldn't even get information from your doctor on where to go in the UK. And actually, that kind of only slightly started to change in the late 80s. There was um, 
there was this is the whole podcast by the way she's listening to mine for the full story I'm probably forgetting <laughs> yeah, a sorry I'm like I need to <laughs> summarize your 10 episodes yeah it did change because basically there was a case there was two legal cases one where the students union were actually sued by Spock for giving out the information in their booklets and they brought it to the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights said or not the European Court of Human Rights the European I think it was company law bizarrely said no you are allowed to give information on a service you can get in another EU country but the actual so then then they were allowed to give that phone number you can't ban somebody from saying here's a mechanic in the UK so you can't ban someone for saying here's an abortion clinic in the UK wow. essentially so yeah it was really and then in 1992 there was a case for a 14 year old girl called Miss X who I think every Irish person knows her story she was a 14 year old girl who um, was abused and she got pregnant and she wanted to go to the UK. Her parents wanted to bring her to the UK for an abortion. They made the mistake, her parents made the mistake of ringing the Garda station to say to the Garda, you know, is there a chance that this can be used in evidence? Is there a DNA sample that we can get, basically, when she has the abortion? And the guards put an injunction on and refused to let her travel. Ugh. And that caused riots, because even the most middle of the road never thought about abortion before was like, but no, that's wrong. Like, you, she should be allowed to travel. And she's like a 14 year so that kind of really was this beginning of the end for those kind of spook people holding power then everyone started to kind of once the kind of veneer goes off then everyone's like no I don't trust you you do have no you're pro-birth you're not pro-birth. yeah I think once the once an organization like that kind of puts their foot down in support of something that everyone pretty much agrees is barbaric you're going they lose a big chunk of their sort of support yeah. that didn't realize they really How? kind of overplayed their hand. Like they were going on the late, late show being like, this is terrible and you shouldn't be allowed to do it. But they just didn't have the public opinion anymore because it was just so clearly. Yeah, it's so, so clearly clear. outrageous. Why wrong in this situation. Like you have to let this 14 year old child go. So yeah, really, that's why like when we, we started to do the podcast, we're like repeal jumpers and everything like that. And like our generation's campaign kind of started in around 2012, but it really has been going on since the eighth amendment was introduced and like we wanted to tell the story of those activists that kind of don't get mentioned as much who were fighting the fight when it was unpopular like it, yeah. was, it was a lot easier for us to wear the repeal jumpers because you know we were going home yeah. to people who were like yeah this is the right thing to do public opinion was on our side so just it's amazing because we got to talk to all these women who are like these really incredibly strong powerful like just you're just you're in awe of them they're brilliant and they're telling you all these stories of the things they did and then you realize that when they were doing all this stuff, they were 25. <laughs> you're like, oh, my God, like you're so like, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And they told us all the gossip as well. So it was great. <laughs> all the things, yeah. I think none of us were journalists who did the podcast. Everyone was very trusting with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so what's your story today for the podcast? Yeah. So I suppose like just to kind of say about how I got involved in my story, basically, and getting involved in repeals can be copy pasted across the rest of the producers for the podcast really they all kind of have the same kind of origin story which is in around 2012 um in October 2012 there a woman called Savita Halapanavar died because she wanted a miscarriage she needed a miscarriage she was or she needed an abortion she was miscarrying and she asked for an abortion and the hospital even though she was miscarrying said she couldn't have one that it was a catholic country and it was against the constitution and she developed sepsis and died and if she had had an abortion, she would have survived. So that kind of story hit the papers, I'd say maybe November 2012. I think kind of like the X case, everybody was just kind of really taken aback. And it took like, I if you had asked me in 2010, are you pro-choice? I would have said, yeah. But I was really passive about it. I would have been like, yeah, Same. I agree that like, women have the right to choose. But I had never examined it. Do you know what I mean? I was like, I'd never gone to a protest. I'd never done anything. Um, and as it turned out, there wasn't wouldn't have been any to have gone to anyway before then, really. It was a quiet time. But it just kind of really upset me and kind of and, and the whole country. So uh, there was massive demonstrations all over the country. And I was going there kind of every Wednesday after work. There was a vigil outside the doll demanding that there was there this should change, that there should be legislation in place to allow a miscar to allow an abortion if a woman's life is at risk, which we had actually voted for, but had never been legislated for. So it was kind of demanding that and trying to get that in. And it was a really emotional time. And actually making the podcast episode about Savita was especially kind of difficult because I'm now older than she was. Oh, <gasps> really? Yeah, she was 31. Oh my God. And when I 
when that story first came out, I was like 22 and, you know, I was really angry or whatever. But now when I'm doing it, I'm like, Jesus Christ, she was younger than me. Like, it oh, just my kind God. Of yeah. Home in a different way, you know, so it was really, really difficult. But I like, yeah. And it's mad, like to think that that's within our lifetime, within our adulthood, even that, yeah. that, that happened. So. I got involved then and I went to the protest and everything, but kind of took maybe more kind of ducked out. There was marriage equality in the meantime that we had to get involved in. There was a lot of stuff going on in those few years. And then around 2017 started to kind of really get involved in the kind of activism side again. So as soon as we knew there was going to be a referendum, we said, right, okay, well, let's look where we are, join the local canvassing group and start going out and, and knocking on doors and trying to get people across the line. So like I'm in Dublin central, um, which like we had too many people out canvassing in Dublin Central. Like there was so many people because it's where people work. It's where kind of there's a high population. So you go for a canvas and there could be 60, 70 people on a random Tuesday night to go canvassing. So it's like I had to go out and do it because I wanted to go out and do it. And I felt I needed to. Yeah. Kind of as much for my own mental health as anything else, because any time that I missed a canvas, I was sitting at home being like, oh, my God, what if we lose? What if we lose? What? You know, you're in your own head about it. So you kind of want to get out and, and do something just to kind of distract yourself because the stakes were so high. We knew if we didn't win in 2018 that we weren't going to get another chance that yeah. it, it would have meant that there was no mandate to repeal the 8th. And so we knew we needed to do it. So at the weekends, Dublin Central, because it was so ridiculous, <laughs> so many people, we went down the country. Oh, no so way. Yeah, so we on a Saturday, you just get a text in the group and be like, we're going down this place, meet here, and whoever had cars would drive down or whatever. So I remember one of my first canvases outside of Dublin. Because I, I, I'm not saying it was easy in Dublin. I think it was hard kind of everywhere, but it was a lot easier in Dublin Central. Like, you could knock on doors and you'd have maybe two or three no's in a night. So it was good to get your confidence up if it was your first time out canvassing. But, like, you know, you're probably having more meaningful conversations other places. And I remember... I went out to Dunboyne, which is only just outside Dublin. Like it's a yeah. half hour drive. But it was so stark, the difference straight away. It actually kind of shocked me. And I started to kind of like, I, I actually was one of those people who never thought we were going to win until the poll results came in. I, or I thought it would be like 51, 49. You know, I didn't think that we were going to win by what we did. But uh, it was about 50, 50 yeses and nos in Dunboyne. Wow. And I remember it's like one of the things that will kind of always stick with me. We got to one kind of cul-de-sac and I was knocking on doors and it was like, yes, after yes, after yes. And I was kind of standing there like, okay, this is good. This is good. This is building up. We got to the last house and there was a guy out the front playing football with his son. And I hated those houses because I like to go up and knock on the door and prepare yourself, but there's someone in the yard. You feel like yeah. you're interrupting them or something. So I was like, oh God, okay. So I was like, hey, can we talk to you about repeal? And he came over and he said, oh, we're definitely yes here. He's like, if, if we'd had repeal before, his mother would still be around. And I was Aww. like, this whole street are going to vote yes because they know what the Eighth Amendment can do. I know, and yeah. It's so black and white, you know, in that yeah. moment. Like, holy, you know, it really hits home. So it was like, it's tough. And there was a lot of conversations like that and a lot of people like that around, you know, who have stories or maybe it's not as severe as that, but who are like, yeah, I can't have children anymore because of this, you know, because, yeah. of, you know, I didn't or... So it was, it was tough. It was harrowing, really. Like you'd come home, like there, it, one of the people on our podcast, Sam, actually put it perfectly when he was like, when you come home from a yes equality campus in 2015, even if it was a bad night, you'd have a buzz. You'd be like, we're fighting the good fight. We're doing it. There, if you could go and knock and get 100 percent yeses in 2018, and you'd still come home just feeling so drained because you've really just gone around and just you're 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 asking for something so fundamental. Thank you, motorbike courier. You're asking for something so fundamental that like it feels it's weird to ask for it, you know? And like yeah. I like I'm I'm married to a woman. Like the marriage equality referendum definitely had more of an impact on my life than than anything else. But this this felt more important. Like it, it affected me more and it just felt like I had to get out there and do it more. So Yeah, that's all- such a powerful point that when people experienced it firsthand they were like oh yeah obviously this is bad yeah. and I've I, I felt that a lot it's even now when I see like people like I still see love both stickers on cars and stuff and I'm like these it's people the just must cut you off as well isn't it it's always the <laughs> like the head is slightest and then they have love both in the back of their car 
<laughs> yeah, they'd run you over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, I might often think like they mustn't have firsthand experience because as soon as you first hand experience something like that, like, you know, and it's yeah, it's just so scary. The fact that you say as well that she was only 31 just blew my mind. I would never took note of the age. No, because we because I was only 22. I didn't really bar- barely pay attention or if I did pay attention, I probably thought 31 is an adult. And now I'm yeah, so it was like, like this. No. That was kind of the same catalyst that got me in, yeah. and I was like, okay, this is wrong. And then it sort of spiraled from there. But yeah, I just never, never copped the age thing. That is mad. That yeah, so things like that could have been happening to people still yeah. now. God, sorry. Anyway, continue. I just those both no, those things no, you no, said really so struck right, me like, there. No, you're so right. Like it's it, and and they really easily could have, and they really easily could be. And even now, the legislation that we have is not good enough. Like, and there are still people who have to travel because it's like we've got a twelve week gestational limit. But like, not everybody knows they're pregnant by twelve weeks. Yes, and I also found out recently that the legislation's gendered, so it yeah. excludes so, trans men. Yeah, well, it's kind of complicated. So the legislation is gendered. It is written women, which there's just literally no need for. I know. But, there's no need for it. Like it just it was the first. Like they, they could have just said women and pregnant people. It, like just literally just that or just even people. Right. Yeah. Just even people. Because I think we can all agree women are people. Like you get some some of the turfs kind of go mad about like saying that women aren't people or whatever. And you're like, it's such a bad argument. It's like, why? Just, <laughs> yeah. that's, just, just you're a person. I'm sorry to break it to you. <laughs> it's just. So basically, yeah. trans men are covered under the legislation anyway, even though it is gendered because um, of the Gender Recognition Act, basically. So they're included because of that. And I think there's another kind of, I know our laws have like a ridiculous clause because basically the translation from Irish to English can be a bit mad. So it's like, ah, uh, okay, okay. There is a clause that basically, if it doesn't make sense, ignore it kind of remember okay right so it's not as yeah it's not as bad as i thought then yeah no they are still covered by it but just not explicitly which does kind of hurt the ridiculous clause came up with um after marriage equality because they almost accidentally made straight marriage illegal if it wasn't for the (laughs) ridiculous clause (laughs) just the way it was translated it was like like basically like women can marry a woman and a man can marry a man but there's no Where I think it was like someone can marry someone of the same gender. So yeah, that's it. Gender. <laughs> oh, that would have been funny. <laughs> Good. I feel like when we made yokes legal for three days a few years ago. Yeah, we really did in Ireland make ecstasy illegal for three days by mistake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's not God. that long ago either. I think that was like maybe 2014, 2015. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so that's not too bad. We've got, I like, and I like the fact it's called a ridiculous law as well. Yeah. Uh, like a yeah. clause. Or I think it's like an absurdity clause or something where if it's yeah, just that like, sounds oh, that's obviously not what we mean. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, canvassing down the country, I can imagine, um, I know you probably got lots of positives, but was there, you were saying like, that's really, was really draining and stuff. I kind of would imagine that, yeah. And I, again, sorry if this is like, sort of making assumptions based on where people live or anything. But like, I would assume that maybe in Dublin, you might might have got more yeses and then you might have faced a little bit more kickback outside of Dublin. It was really hit and miss, I have to say. Some areas of Dublin were a mix um, and some areas of Dublin were not. And there was a real class divide in that, in that wealthier areas were very mixed because if they needed an abortion, they could travel. I was like, interesting yeah because we we canvassed all around because i'm in the city center like we canvassed around like the flats on dorset street and like ballybock house which are like just people there have been completely abandoned basically and you're like knocking on doors and you get the same question on both doors which was like is it going to be on the medical card but the difference in tone was amazing because you get you go to like glass nevin to like one of the fancy estates and they're like well will it be on the medical card and then you go to the flats and they're like, but will it be on the medical card? Like, will I, will this actually, will I be able to access this? Was the under thing. And wow. it was just so stark. Because you get like a very big kind of mix of like wealth disparity, I suppose, like in, in Dublin Central. But that was like another big thing that kind of stuck out to me in the campaign. In the country, you would get more, I tell you, the, I, I canvassed the town that I'm from, Banagher in Offaly, right? Which is a population of about 2,000 people, maybe, on a good day. 
and it's it's so different going up and knocking on a door when you know who's going to answer the door do you know what I mean yeah and you're like oh this is going to be Tom Kelly here behind this door you know <laughs> or whatever and like the, it was it was actually a really good canvas we only got I think maybe two or three no's in the whole town like everybody was basically there but what was so interesting so I got down to the canvas in Offaly and I was given this big bag of badges and this load of leaflets and in Dublin Central, like we were like hoarding the badges and everything because everybody wants them. And you're like, no, you can have three badges tonight and give them to your three favorite doors or whatever. But they gave us like, I probably got about 50 when I was down in Offaly. And I was like, Jesus Christ, this is mad. Like you're giving out all these things. But I realized when I knocked on the door, every single door was the same conversation where it was like, oh yeah, I'm a yes, but I, I'd say you're finding it tough in the town. And I'm like, your two neighbors on either side are yes, both you. You're not talking about it. Like, like, and then you're like, take five badges, wear them to school when you're doing the run. Like everybody here is a yes, but you're not talking about it. Which like, you know, you're from a small town as well. Yeah. People just are like, you know, don't want anyone kind of talking about them. But it was so that is weird. I mad. was like, you have no idea. Like every single one of your neighbors is voting yes. And literally not one of you has had a conversation. And you're all afraid to like publicly show your You're like looking colors. at the door like, I see you're finding it hard in the town, are you? Yeah, it must be tough. You're like, no, it's the best town I've ever been. Like, <laughs> higher than Stony Batter in the banner. Like, <laughs> and uh, so did you canvas in that town for um, the marriage equality referendum as well? No, I couldn't face it. For marriage equality, Fair enough. it was like, for marriage equality we stayed in Dublin I actually did very little canvassing I did a little bit of leafleting and I did a good bit of kind of media stuff because I actually just couldn't face it to knock on a door and be like sorry am I allowed <laughs> like yeah you know? no that's totally fair enough so I just could but then like I did have I felt the responsibility to go out even more for appeal because I was like I know all my straight friends who went out and canvassed for me and I'm going to go and canvass for them now because like realistically like okay obviously nobody knows what's going to happen in their life but I'm unlikely to have been affected by the Eighth Amendment compared to like heterosexual couple, basically. Yeah, I see what you mean. They're not going to get pregnant accidentally or whatever. You never know what's going to happen, but it's not likely to have impacted me as much. But I have friends who've had abortions and they couldn't. If somebody said to me in a door, like, no, you're all baby murderers, I'd be like, all right, grand, see you later, Fidelma, like, you know, (laughs) whatever. But it wouldn't impact me as much as somebody. Yes, I understand. Yeah. So I felt like, okay, I got to go out and kind of gotta go out and do it yeah because for me it felt really like asking for your life to matter it felt yeah. really personal to me and yeah. uh like I don't know if it's it's probably not relevant but like my my when my mother was younger when she was she, she wasn't younger than me she was 40 I think um well no sorry sorry she was 40 and she had me so she would have been about 35 maybe but she had a boy before me that was still born and just as part of the whole weirdness in Ireland like around babies and stuff he was just taken away before she woke up and she never saw him ever again because he was unbaptized and off he went to purgatory and like who who cares this kind of thing um and that affected her for the rest of her life I don't know it's not quite the same thing but at the same time that was always it's that culture of shame yeah why we ever had the eighth amendment was that culture of shame and that idea that women are to be controlled yeah and anything to do with women has to be controlled. I, like abortion, like it's it's about power. It's about them saying you have to have this baby, and I decide if you do or don't. Yeah. If we take that power for ourselves, that's terrifying to that kind of like mentality. But like when the Eighth Amendment was introduced, and like when we were born, like there were still Magdalene laundries. Yeah. There were still mother and baby homes. Those things were still going on. So if you had a child or you were pregnant without being married. You could be sent there. Like it's the last one closed John McDermott Street in 1996. God, you know, that like, is recent. When we made our communion, do you know what I mean? Oh like, my God, it's crazy to think about. Dave, you know, um, he saw says that's the year that Wannabe came out. <laughs> like, like, do you think about that? Yeah. Like, it's crazy. Make that one make sense in your head. Like, oh my God, it's that, it's that whole thing of like we get to say who does what yeah and it's just about them holding all the cards basically yeah i'm saying like no if you step out of line then we have a place for you yeah and then there's like they try and push it off now and say like that oh you know but nobody like you know is the the family sent them in or whatever you terrified the families like you stood on the pulpit yeah i I really i don't like the pushing of the blame onto the families like obviously the families. Like they didn't just have this idea, oh, I'll ask Father Murphy to set up a mother and baby home. Yeah, they were you know, afraid of the church. Happened. 
Like they, they felt like they had to do it. And like, yeah, it's not like they decided to do it. And yeah, they obviously sort of went along with it, I guess. But like, what's the alternative? Flee the country. Yeah, that's it. And like the, the shame and stigma around being an unmarried mother, which is such like strange language to say now because I actually don't even know if I if I have any friends who got married before this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's amazing how much that's changed in, in one generation. But like the shame and stigma around that was such that you, you did what you could, you know. Yep. I think it's kind of part of that same shame of like going canvassing for a and people be like, oh I'd say you're finding it difficult in the town. Just talk to each other. Like yeah. just talk to each yeah. other. <laughs> just like, well, loud and proud wear your badge around yeah, what the hell it. I feel like that's kind of a fairly new thing maybe with like our generation or maybe the, just the generation before but like no it's crazy it's like we've been living under this for so long that you like, like when I look at it I was thinking like how it's like I remember just asking my dad why both he and my mom went to the Pope's visit in 1977 like they're not like super religious like they would have gone to mass when we were kids or whatever I don't think I didn't go now and he was like, you don't understand. That's the only thing that happened. In my yeah. And I'd say at the time, the Pope was like a fucking celebrity. You just went. Like, yeah. he's, there was, he's like, there's no, there was nothing else going on for the two years around that. <laughs> so if you didn't go, you had no stories. <laughs> it was like, that's the level. Like, we just can't kind of relate to it. Like, so no. much. Is, like, like I, don't, I don't, nobody went to see the Pope, I think, when he came here this time. I think they got it. Yeah, I didn't even realize he came again. <laughs> there won't yeah. be a whole generation named after him this time anyway. Yeah, that's for sure. We went up to um because we had we were already recording the podcast at that stage. We started recording the podcast about two weeks after appeal because we were just like, no, I have to keep talking about this, still kind of processing it, which I actually think was maybe putting off processing it for three years, like what we've been through, just by going over the stories. But we went, we had like our little pocket microphones and we went up to record kind of what people were saying why were people going to the Pope why were people protesting it and actually a group of the the guys Deirdre who's the other person who edited it with me and she wrote most of the script um met this woman who had actually escaped from mother and baby home in the 70s and she was protesting the Pope's visit and she was like they don't control us anymore and it's great to see this amount of people protesting yeah so it's like really powerful like what we've managed to achieve in one generation yeah, Ireland. I think it's just amazing to think about and like amazing to think about like that it's our generation you know and you wonder like wh- what would I have done if I was born 20 years earlier like would I have voted in the 8th amendment there's every chance that I would have because like mm. that was you don't know so I've never asked my parents how they voted in 83 because it's none of my business yeah, yeah. I really voted yes to repeal it in 2018 <laughs> that's yeah. all I know that's all you need to know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so sorry did you say you started making the podcast back the year of the yeah, vote started making it in 2018 so it's like yeah this is like th- my advice to anyone wanting to start a podcast is just pick something that isn't close to everyone's hearts and that won't take three years of research just pick something just watch a movie and talk about the movie that's my advice <laughs> like do that instead because it was so much work yeah so we started yeah about two weeks after it was actually Finn Dwyer who does the Irish history podcast it was actually his idea so he was in Dublin Central as well. And he was like, he had made a podcast during the campaign about just kind of like facts and kind of like myth busting. Like, you know, I'd interviewed a few people who were active in the campaign, like the guys who did Men for Appeal and, and all that kind of crack. So he was like, let's do one that's going to, because he's a historian. He's like, let's do one that's like the history. Um, and then like after a couple of months, he ended up having to move down to um, Kilkenny. So he just kind of dropped out, but he, this is his microphone still. He gave us that and he's been great kind of giving us advice and stuff. So we basically realized that we had a lot of research to do because we wanted to tell the whole story. So it took probably about a year and a half of like research to figure out where do we want to start? Because you could you could start back in the 40s if you wanted to. We we're like, no, we have to pick we have to yeah. pick a point. So we said, we'll do the history of the Eighth Amendment from its introduction to its repeal and how that's impacted what we're living under now as regards legislation. So it was a lot of work and we, we started recording interviews, I think, in 2019. And then we had to stop, obviously, with COVID because we we kind of couldn't travel around. There was a few people that we wanted to talk to that we didn't get to talk to, like in Derry and in Cork and, and Leitrim and a few places. Um, but when we looked at it, basically, we sat on it for a year, like all the recordings. And then we were kind of talking in January. And I think like I played, we'd made a promo in 2019 because we had anticipated having it out actually this time last year. Um, for the two-year anniversary 
And I listened back to the promo and I was like, this promo is actually really good. I think we actually might be making a really good podcast. Maybe we should pick up this project again. And when we actually looked at the interviews that we had, we realized that we didn't have any gaps. So we were worried that we didn't have a part of the story. We yeah. were like, no, actually, we can't tell the story with these interviews that we have. So then we started editing it. So myself and Deirdre, literally every Saturday from about January, were writing, recording, editing the podcast. And then I had to do all the voiceover work. I had to take a week off work to do all the voiceover bits. Literally, you're in my wardrobe now, which has a duvet up above it. And I put the duvet down to create a recording studio. It was kind of a great kind of freeing thing for us because at the start, when, when COVID happened, all the podcasts that we listened to, people were like, I'm recording this from my wardrobe. And we were like, man, you can get really good sound quality in a wardrobe, actually. And we can do this. Like, <laughs> so it probably saved us some money. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't feel the need to go get a studio. Um, exactly. But yeah, you know, because I've seen you mention the cupboard or the wardrobe before on yeah, Twitter. Look, this is, you can see that's a coat. Oh, look yeah. at that. Yeah. To be fair, wardrobe. it's a much bigger wardrobe than I expected when I pictured it. Oh, Although, you're on a slant, like it's tiny. It's the width of like an Ikea desk. It's about like a, a meter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I kind of what I expected. We're in, we're in the, the spare room. So like there's a bed like right here. So I can't sit in it. Just for me. It's like basically recording in an attic. But it sounds great. Like you'd never tell that it's not done in like a studio. We were so relieved that it sounded as good as it did. <laughs> because this is the thing, like none of us like on the team had ever written anything, had ever produced anything like other than like the odd like project or whatever in college. And it never recorded anything before. So we really had to learn absolutely everything. Like Finn showed us how to edit. Very basic, like shows how to, you know, select and delete or whatever. And I had done some editing in college, like on films. So I was like, okay, this is the same kind of logic or whatever. But apart from that, it was very much kind of learn on the fly. So it was it was good. We were so relieved. Like every time we, we did an episode, we were like, I can't believe we actually did an episode. <laughs> and just out of curiosity, what did you use to edit the audio? We used Audacity. So it's Ooh, free. I love it's a bit of Audacity. Yeah, it's so, so handy. It has everything. And then to host the podcast, we, if anyone is as useless as we are, because we, we recorded literally, we brought the microphone to people's houses or their offices or wherever they could meet us. And a few of them came actually to Deirdre's parents' house and we were allowed to use their dining room for a lot of our interviews, which was great. Um, so the, the the levels were kind of all over the place. Some of them were really quiet because like, we couldn't get the microphone close enough to them or whatever. Um, so we used this thing that we call Magic Mic, which is like Magic Mastering, which came with the podcast host thing that just levels all the audio. So it's the same volume. Oh, amazing. I was like, I genuinely, I was like having a nervous breakdown thinking, how am I going to make these levels right? And then Deirdre sent me a text and she's like, if we pay six euro extra, it'll do this for us. It was like it's the best six euro I ever spent. That is amazing. <laughs> what was your podcast host? Uh, Buzzsprout. Oh, no way. And that yeah. does that. Ooh, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a tip, yeah. Sponsored by Buzzsprout. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned when we were chatting beforehand as well, you mentioned Canva, and I love Canva as well. Oh, a bit of Canva, yeah. Yeah, because it just does it all for you, like all the scheduling and everything. It's brilliant. You could do one of these now. You know these, I keep getting ads from on Instagram, podcasting courses. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> start your own podcast. <laughs> oh, man, we, me and Judah have made a pact with each other because we were the guys who did like the most of the editing and stuff, so kind of we're deepest in it I suppose like for the last year we're taking July off from all projects I'm so excited I'm not going to do and that. work I like you no 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 I'm going to work but like <laughs> no projects because this has literally been so many hours a day like it's about like so it's it's all your weekend basically and then probably like one or two hours even I was saying to you before I have to make another promo now after this because somebody said oh I'll share your podcast on my podcast if you send me over an ad and then we realized all our ads say coming soon none of them say out now <laughs> so I have to do another one it's like a minute so it's kind of never ending that's the thing actually the one thing about making a podcast I never anticipated is the admin I did not realize it was going to be as admin heavy as it is yeah the promotion and everything like yeah there's so much yeah yeah and like you kind of get the bit of like organic reach or whatever on Twitter which is good like it's what we're liking now is so episode nine is coming out tomorrow which is the 22nd and that's the actually the last full episode that's the whole story and then we have another episode coming out on Friday. That's I'm calling it like a quilt episode, which is all the great stories that just didn't fit in in the other yes. episodes that were really good anecdotes, basically, that people told us. And then it's done. Then we're finished the podcast and it's just promo from here on out, 
we wanted to kind of get it out pretty quick because um, it's just the episodes are so short. We didn't want to have too much in each episode. So we're like, let's do two a week, half hour episodes rather than one hour long episode where people are just going to be literally like crying in a ball when able to stand up when they finish listening to it because it's so harrowing. Like it's so difficult to kind of to hear. So it's kind of a good length. But yeah, I can't wait. Well, we're getting a good bit now of, of feedback from people that we don't know, which is great because the first couple of weeks it was all feedback from people we do know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's and when you know it's working is when read. people you don't yeah. know start feedback like, to you. Or review and you take a screenshot and send it to the group chat being like, does anyone know him? And they're like, no, we don't know him. He just liked it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great feeling <laughs> and so yeah how has the overall reaction been so far it's actually it's it's been all positive well it's not been all positive there's a few anti-choicers who we've who've reached out to us on twitter and instagram or whatever but sure you'll have that it's like a, a dying wasp yeah um, they're always there even you if you're not talking them. about repeal they're just there yeah <laughs> just literally giving their literally. opinions exactly like they'll just dm you the most random stuff anyway so it's like like we expected that i don't consider that to be hate because no. if they liked us we'd, we'd have done something wrong so yeah. that's, also, like, <laughs> that's also good for us but uh so far all the people that we wanted to like it liked it which is a bit of a relief because we do kind of criticize it's not like this was a fantastic campaign and everything was done right and everybody felt included the whole way along it's like no a lot of people were excluded Trans people were excluded. Migrants were excluded. And actually, kind of worse, I think migrants were excluded, but Savita's face was used constantly. And she was a migrant woman. And the kind of intersection between her being a migrant woman and her, like, the, there, there was kind of a correlation between, like, I don't know if what happened to her would have happened to a white Irish person, a white Irish settled person. I don't think it would have. Um, we'll never know. But yeah it didn't have no impact as Emily was accessing the podcast. It didn't have no impact. Um, but also she was used a lot by certain, not really in the 2018 campaign in fairness, everybody was pretty respectful, but she was used a lot, but yet it was seen as a problem for us as like white Irish settled people to solve and not actually include migrant voices or see how they can, what their feedback is like what's their experience which is so valuable it's totally left out so we do talk about that and we do yeah. talk to, to those people and um, so we were kind of expecting a bit more criticism maybe from some people because and I totally would understand it and like absolutely no judgment because a lot of people myself included gave a lot to Together for Yes and I'll always be really proud of the work that I did for Together for Yes and like the campaigning that we did like I, I have no regrets for going out and doing that but I also think that we need to look at it and learn from it. Yeah. Because I don't think I, we we had the opportunity to learn those yes lessons with Yes Equality in 2015. And I don't think we really did. I think it was kind of valorized. And it was a really good campaign and it was brilliant. And, you know, I'm also really proud of everybody who was involved in that campaign. And I'm really grateful for the result, obviously, because I'm married to a woman because of that result. <laughs> but it did leave people out. It left trans people out again. It left bisexual people out. Like, and it left, you know, people in non-conventional relationships out. Uh, it was very much your white picket fence, cisgender gay men kind of campaign. And I think maybe if we'd examined that a bit more at the time, we might have had a different Together for Yes campaign. But then you never know. Like, I mean, would going back in time, if you knew that we were going to win by 66%, maybe you would have changed some things. But if you said to me, without the benefit of hindsight, will you change one thing? I'd be like, no. Like people, you're knocking on doors, and people were saying, "I agree with. I'm going to vote for repeal, but I don't think that it should be accessible to uh, people who just want to use it as a contraception." That's an annoying argument, yeah. It's it's such a stupid argument because it's literally like, first of all, literally, it's not contraception because there has been conception, so it's yes. literally just exactly wrong, right? And second of all, would you prefer somebody had a baby they didn't want? Like, what's what's your alternative here, sir? Like, what you just saying? No, I want to punish sluts. Like, what are you <laughs> well, that's that's essentially it. It's yeah, pleasing like, how people if, conceive. If, yeah, it's literally like if you want to have sex, then you should definitely have to be forced to have a baby and raise that baby to adulthood and for yeah. the rest of your life deal with the consequences of one time. That argument frustrated me because it was like, 
who would like it's expensive <laughs> to get an abortion like who would go i can get a 50 euro more natural pill or i could just wait and get an abortion later and it's cost me four like, times as much. Do that? exactly <laughs> like and like look people do find themselves pregnant that they didn't think that they were going to be pregnant and they yeah. do have it is to prevent like you having a child you don't want to do there's no such thing tara flynn says this great thing where she's like if you say like i agree with abortion you know, in case of fatal fetal abnormality or in case of like a sexual assault or whatever, but you don't agree with it. What you're saying is you don't agree with how that person had sex. Yes, exactly. It's the same procedure. In yeah. both cases, the same procedure. So it's it's just a really unexamined thought. I think. You just, yeah, you don't agree with people who have sex by choice. It's essentially yeah, it's, like, it's literally yeah. it. It's literally it. And like, and, and I'd say if you said that to people, they probably would say, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. They just haven't thought about it. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, they haven't thought through. So, but on the doors, when people were like, I'm going to vote for appeal, you'd push it, but only so far. You'd be like, yeah, well, you know, like, I mean, everyone's situation is different. And, you know, there's no such thing really as a hard case. And it is the same procedure. And people would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just hope it doesn't go in with that. And then, like, after a while, you'd just be like, I'll just take the yes. Do you know what I mean? And everyone was doing that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Everyone was like, look, whatever this lad thinks, like. <laughs> yeah, at least we're getting a yes. So don't need to bring know, him like, fully over to our side. more doors to knock on today. Like, he's. You know, okay, fine. That's a bad opinion, but fine. You know, <laughs> shit take, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I wonder if I could go back now. Would I spend longer on those doors and say like, I don't oh, know, it's know, so draining. It. Like, it'd be so that's draining. It. It's also mentally exhausting. Yeah, like arguing with someone, especially. I feel like, especially if if you can really see your point of view and you just can't get them to see it, it is so draining. Yeah, I have to say. The, one thing that I will always be grateful for, and it's come up again and again and again since repeal, is I really learned how to go to like a calm place in my brain when someone is saying the most heinous, horrible, you just are so morally opposed to it. You're like, oh my God. And your brain is just like, how does a person think like this? This is just so evil. And then what comes out of your mouth is like, okay, I hear you <laughs> now, you know, and then you're like, but what about actually giving shit about your fellow human beings <laughs> you know, like, but in a really calm way and have a yeah. conversation with them and it was amazing like I like it was it was great to, to have that and it's actually it's come up again and again and again in work people just say the most stupid thing and you're like oh, the oh interesting thought yeah what about that? you know like you just <laughs> yeah. calm. so it's kind of a good skill um so everyone should go canvassing but hopefully we will never have to campaign for human rights again because it's such a horrible thing to have to do yeah and we had to do it twice in uh, what two three years yeah three years and it's like those three years for me have just meshed into one campaign you know it's mm. just like, oh yeah those yeah yeah in my head they're way closer together than they were in real life yeah because it was actually the same weekend in may for both of them with three years apart oh, may no way. 22nd was the vote for um marriage equality and may 25th was the repeal so it's like yeah so facebook memories absolute write off for that whole <laughs> month like oh my god you can't even like i very rarely go on facebook now anyway but like i'm just like no can't look it's too emotional <laughs> just look at posts where you were obviously having a nervous breakdown yeah well thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story yeah no problem oh i want to tell you one last thing because i think it's go really it. funny okay okay so the last bit of campaigning that I did for repeal, right? So it was the day of the vote. It was the 25th and it was about nine o'clock at night and we were doing get out the vote because you're actually not allowed to say, you're not allowed to really canvas within like a certain amount of certain space between the center you can vote in or whatever. So we just had these big signs that was like, go and vote, basically vote yes, go and vote. And I was standing on Dorset Street just down the road from my house and this old woman came up to me. I say old woman, actually, she was probably only in her 60s. She came up to me and she grabbed the poster from my hand and I like, went to grab it back and then she said I just want to hold it and it confused me so much that I let go of it and she threw it into Dorset Street and I got run over by two buses straight away and then I just looked at it and I was like I'm going home <laughs> so she didn't just want to hold it the old no, she threw it on the street I was just like I was like okay this is bad and then luckily about 45 minutes later the exit poll came in and we knew we'd won but I yeah. was like what a way to end it <laughs> oh my god yeah what a way to end it just but also what a great move from her I just want to hold it I was like okay <laughs> she knew how to get away that is smart like, like why <laughs> you, yeah it is a bit weird but you were probably like okay cool 
well, you just kind of stop thinking because you're so tired and the adrenaline is going out. I was probably already thinking then like, okay, the exit pole is coming in. Did she have a good throw in her at least? <laughs> she fired it out in tra- two lanes of traffic, like two buses ran over it. I was there waiting Some for the lights bus. to go. Sunlight arrow there. The pathetic thing ever, you know, that you're waiting there for the lights to go and then the lights go green and you just <laughs> creep out, pick up your sign, <laughs> go back home. Was it in bits or was it of- still in one piece? It was in one piece, but it had like the tire tracks over it or whatever. Like it was so pathetic. But like, hopefully, like if some, if I had seen that and I hadn't voted, I'd have been like, okay, I'm going to go and vote yes. Because that was an outrage. <laughs> yeah, know? hopefully there's a couple of people watching from above. Like, no, that's it. We're like, pulling in. We're voting. <laughs> yeah, the <that's laughs> change yeah. Oh God. So tell everyone where to find you online and where to find the podcast. Yeah, so the podcast is at How the Yes Was Won across the board. I'm at hash underscore dog with two G's <laughs> on Twitter, <laughs> which I should probably change. When you set up your Twitter when you're about 19, you have a really dumb name and then you just kind of have to keep it. Um, and then I'm uh, Ashling Spooky Queen on uh, Instagram, which I actually changed my ad about two years ago there. So I don't even have an excuse for that. I'll, I'll put all your links down in the description and the <laughs> yeah. podcast is available on all the usual. It's everywhere it's on. Yeah. And there's transcripts. Actually, there's transcripts available as well of all the episodes on the website. So, and there's um, descriptions of all of we've got. If, if you are hearing impaired or visually impaired, you can access the podcast and all the marketing. We oh, have brilliant. It. Accessible. Yeah. That's a lot of the admin that we had to do, but it's there. <laughs> that must have taken forever. <laughs> well, so long like and, and do you know what it's done it's inoculated me against you know when people hear their own voice they're like oh i hate hearing my own voice yeah I'm immune at this point <laughs> like, it has no effect on me <laughs> oh thank you so much for coming on yeah thanks for having me and uh, yeah everyone go check out how the s was won on all the different podcasting platforms and or the website uh, thank you so much for listening or watching if you watched on YouTube um, the Storytime podcast is available on all of the usual podcasting platforms and if you listen on the audio ones if you could give us a rating that'd be great if you watch on YouTube sure just throw a like um, and subscribe if you haven't and uh, yeah thank you Ashing, and I will see you in the next one bye bye this podcast was brought to you by The Shift for more like this check out theshift.ie